This week, it's Groundhog Day meets 1984. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape, 20 on Friday, Vaping New Science and Advocacy Report for the 16th of July, 2021. Yeah, it's the same cycle over and over again, day after day, as the well-financed misinformation campaigns, propaganda, keeps permeating people believing nothing but poppycock. But dude... You state it's Groundhog Day meets 1984. We already know Bloomberg is funding all the misinformation around the globe. We already know tobacco giants are becoming pharmaceutical companies. That's not worthy of George Orwell's 1984. Oh, yeah? Well, buddy, when Biden picks Dr. Raul Gupta to lead the federal drug policy because he's an ex-wavering physician, heralding sublocaine and Narcan from West Virginia, the worst state dealing with the opioid crisis, which was only created because of hedonistic pharmaceutical company profits, people are going to expect a champion of harm reduction. But what they're actually going to get is the exact opposite, just like tobacco companies buying off pharmaceutical players In the name of diversification, it's not diversification that they're truly interested in. They're only interested in making money the same way they always have. Take a leaf and process it into profits. Ain't nothing to it but to get into it. Like I said last week, The gentrification of vaping continues as Philip Morris International bought out UK-based Vectora for a billion pounds or one and a half billion dollars. Well, Quasi Quartang, the British business secretary who questioned activist investor Elliott's shakeup at GlaxoSmithKline, he's not buying PMI's beyond nicotine strategy. Why is this UK Conservative Party secretary so worried about its little farmer darlings? I mean, I understand the argument of not allowing the Pfizer buyout of AstraZeneca to protect UK jobs, but where's the protectionism angle coming from? I don't see the secretary making any hay about the 80 Liverpool jobs that were just lost because Imperial Brands announced a major restructure? Or is it because the Liverpool jobs were at a vaping e-liquid manufacturing facility? That is all the R&D staff and half of the workforce in Liverpool. Why is this business secretary so anti-vaping? Is this another poly in the pocket of Bloomberg? Moving on to India because PMI isn't the only tobacco company working on its exit strategy. I mean diversification. ITC diversifying tobacco business into manufacturing of nicotine and nicotine salts. And naturally, they aren't going to allow this new venture to be stigmatized with the word tobacco. So they created a brand new company called Indivision limited and they're going to be setting up a plant in Mysuru in Karnataka to export nicotine and nicotine salts for vaping all while conforming to stringent US and EU pharmacological standards guess with the covid situation being what it is their hotel chains didn't make any money or at least as much money as they were expecting So time to revert back to the devil that they know and convert tobacco leaves into nicotine. And since vaping is banned in India, all of their production is going to be exported out of the country. Because that makes total environmental sense. Export your production from the heart of the country, halfway around the globe to the United States and to Europe. Moving on to other tobacco companies and their shift 
into inhaled medicine business. Did you know British American Tobacco and Altria are now in the cannabis industry? Did you know PMI is considering buying AstraZeneca to do lung cancer treatment? Talk about a top-to-bottom, end-to-end business model. And vaping is their annoying consumer-driven nemesis, preventing all their profit potential from seeing the light of day. What a tangled web they weave. All they need now is some alcohol, and they can just go ahead and complete the party supplies everybody just wants to have. Oh, wait, they already tried that and failed. Altria sells St. Michelle Wine Estates business to Sycamore Partners for $1.2 billion in cash. Guess there's more money in cannabis and drugs than there is in alcohol. Maybe that's why British American Tobacco invested $25 million U.S. or $31 million Canadian dollars in Trait Biosciences Incorporated. Considering Trait Biosciences holds a patent on how to make CBD completely water-soluble, it's no wonder the London-based maker of Views Vaping spent this drop in the bucket to them. I mean, it's only money, and they already know the consequences of not owning a patent to something or filing a patent for something first. It's the reason British American Tobacco took Philip Morris International to court over the patents for e-cigarette technology. And they won when Judge Marcus Smith invalidated four patents for heated smoking systems with an improved heater that creates aerosol from heating and not burning tobacco. Speaking of heat not burn, there's a Eureka alert from Imperial Brands. Documenting the aerosol from heat not burn products dissipate 10 seconds after every puff. And this is in stark contrast to smoke from analog cigarettes that contain volatile chemicals which linger in the air for 30 to 45 minutes. The recent study on emission particle dynamics was published in aerosol and air quality research and clearly demonstrated the dramatic differences between analog cigarettes with the longest lasting and most dangerous emissions, heated tobacco products with 10% the danger in duration, and electronic cigarettes which had the least measurable, least damaging, and shortest lasting emissions. Once again, science proves the harm reduction potential of vaping. But now it's time for the weekly public safety announcement. If you vape using a device that lets you change your batteries, do not throw the batteries in your pocket with coins or keys. The Daily Record reported vaping e-cigarette explodes in Scott's man's pocket, leaving him with serious burns. Actually, if you read the article, you find out this putz put his unprotected spare batteries in his pocket along with his car keys. Pay attention, because I've only said this like a thousand times. These are high amperage lithium ion batteries that can go into a thermal runaway if you short them out. And the last thing you want is for a battery to vent because you were misinformed or just lazy. This guy learned the lesson the hard way, and now he's got burns on his hands simply because he was just careless. I mean, if it's not charging or in the vape, it must be in a case. Oh, and if you always follow battery safety, then my message to you is be courteous to the people around you when you vape because a bouncer attacked a couple who wouldn't stop vaping inside the Liverpool Smoky Moe's City Center Bar. The bouncer swept a 31-year-old woman's leg from under her and punched her partner in the face. It's taken two years for this woman's leg to fully heal and for the matter to end up in the Liverpool Crown Court. Long story short, be courteous to those around you when you vape and put your vape away when asked, especially if you're vaping indoors. Please, and thank you. Moving on. Moving on to the consequences of COVID, tax increases, and ridiculous regulations. We've all seen the consequences of COVID lockdowns this past year, but probably the worst one hit by COVID lockdowns was Italy. So how has the COVID emergency affected the vaping sector in Italy? Italy lost 127 authorized vaping stores in the past six months. That translates to a 5% drop in the number of stores for the entire country. 
While that number might seem low to some people, it has a much different meaning when I reveal the fact that in some parts of Italy, there is one vape store to service 42,000 smoking residents. In the context of vape stores per smoker, that 5% drop takes on a whole new meaning. And if governments truly cared about their smokers, they would supply small business loans for people to open up more vape shops. Or maybe the Italian government doesn't care about the 11.6 million smokers they have. Moving on to Poland, where the Minister of Finance sneakily implemented excise taxes and EU-mandated reforms have the people demanding poll exit. Ministry of Finance Tadeusz Kuczynski is being called out for non-transparent rules for select working groups, including the vape industry. Piotr Lezinski, president of the Vaping Association Polska, says, We are very disappointed with the procedure for setting up an excise form and more specifically excise tables, in which the access to the table was determined by fractions of a second. We registered at 3.01, which was one minute after the application form was made available to us. He continues later stating, Today we are off the board and we are threatened that it is foreign companies that will decide how the law is established in Poland. This is a very frustrating situation for us. We are Polish entrepreneurs. We pay taxes to Poland, and we would like to be treated at least on an equal footing with foreign participants in this marketplace. What is he talking about? And why is he arguing with the finance minister? Well, it's about the EU mandatory excise taxes I reported on a few weeks ago. The vape mail ban isn't just an American issue. Everyone in Europe ordering items from outside the EU must have their package opened and searched to determine the appropriate excise tax that the recipient is going to have to pay. This means that if you order something and it only costs a euro or maybe even a few euros, the excise tax may be more than the item that you ordered. And since this isn't the only issue demanded by the EU consortium, I'll just jump to the chase and report. Poland court ruled EU measures are unconstitutional. So the EU commission can fuck right off. You heard of Brexit. Well, now here comes the gradual poll exit from the EU legal order. Meanwhile, in the US, the vape mail ban and all the tax increases have started to drive up crime rates. But Representative Roger Krista Morphy doesn't give a shit and pushes more taxes on the federal level. Of all the people representing an area in the United States, this bonehead should know best of all the consequences of prohibition and taxes. He's representing an area just outside downtown Chicago, Illinois. How many people need to die and how many businesses must suffer from this guy ignoring the real problems caused by a prohibition and taxing people until they can't afford it anymore? It's beyond time for harm reduction to mitigate or eliminate the human cost of his policies that only cause suffering and death. Well, Chicago, Illinois isn't the only one dealing with the consequences of prohibition and the federal vape mail ban. Lincoln, Nebraska, Cloud Nine Smoke Shop is frustrated beyond belief while the police are starting to investigate the stacking number of local vape shop break-ins. CBD Remedies and Cloud9 Smoke Shop had their front doors smashed in as burglars took whatever they could carry in the midnight hour. Generation V e-cigarette and vape bar was also burglarized around 4.30 Wednesday morning with a preliminary loss of around $2,000 plus $1,700 in broken glass and furniture. We just covered Generation V Vapor's grand opening not that long ago. And how they had to open up more stores, all because of the vape mail ban. Well, now they're feeling the pain from the customers who can't afford these higher prices. And the crooks that are trying to get product inventory for their black market sales. That only exists because the government introduced this prohibition and these ridiculous taxes. I knew it was just a matter of time before this started happening to vape shops. When you artificially inflate the cost of any product, 
the inevitable crime wave is going to be right around the corner. Moving on to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where several vape shop owners have signed the AVA petition asking FedEx to reconsider its ban on shipping vapes. And it got some press time. Fox 23 News' Scott Martin covered the story of Jennifer Burton, who owns Vape This stores in Tulsa and Broken Arrow. And she explained how the post office isn't the best carrier for legally licensed stores to get inventory. She also told the reporter that she's paying up to 50% more in shipping costs because UPS and FedEx decided to ban these harm reduction products. She also said that if the post office stops delivering vape products, the only option she's got left is to have somebody literally drive to New York or California to pick up the inventory that she needs for her stores. Stripping legal vendors from easily getting inventory is only going to mean that more of these stores are going to be going out of business. Higher prices for stores that stay open and growth of a black market needed to fill the void because of prohibition and higher prices. You would think at some point people would learn from history. Prohibition caused the mass crime waves and organization of the mob to fill the black market demands for alcohol. How many people needlessly died then? And how many people are going to die now because history is always going to repeat itself until people finally learn from it? Moving on to Harrisburg, Virginia, where it's 1984 in full swing. As respiratory therapists from Centara RMH are lying to children, telling them that vaping is loaded with chemicals and heavy metals, let alone the nicotine is going to addict them if they try it in a vape. Well, now, thanks to a $150,000 grant from the Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth. <coughs> Another Bloomberg recipient of propaganda money. Ron Couple will be able to continue lying to kids for another 10 years. Yeah, you heard that right. He said he's been warning kids about vaping for the past 10 years. Hey, lying Ron, you're not empowering these kids to make their own choices if you fill their heads with misinformation. You're brainwashing these kids into thinking that a 95% safer product is just as harmful as lighting something on fire. Stop lying to the next generation because in a decade, history is going to prove you're the reason they got hooked because you lied to them in the name of youth prevention. More like youth promotion of deadly products because the kids are being told there's no difference between harm reduction products and the actual products that people light on fire and breathe in. Turns my stomach every time I have to report about these health agencies lying to kids, knowing their indoctrination is just going to cause some of these kids to dive right into the deep end of the addiction pool one day. Well, at least it's still not as bad as it is in Egypt. The article's titled, Fighting Addiction in Egypt? Dialing a new life. Like dialing a phone number is going to actually make a difference. What a mockery for the real consequences of addiction. The National Fund for Drug Control and Treatment of Addiction is following the World Health Organization demands. And Egypt's new draft law that mandates drug tests for state employees. Here we go. The Puritans have won in Egypt and think that this is going to guarantee them a drug-free society because of a hotline. Well, the bill requires prospective and existing employees at ministries, state companies, local authorities, and other state bodies to undergo drug testing before they get hired, when they're promoted, awarded a contract, or are going to have their contract renewed. The new law will be implemented starting next year and provides free and confidential treatment for those who turn themselves in. But anyone who doesn't turn themselves in and test positive is going to get terminated and face legal consequences. The article even goes so far as to pointing out that smoking leads to alcohol, which leads to hash, and then pills before reaching rock bottom. They also talk about this like it's some religious crusade permeating all of Egypt as they seek volunteers to raise awareness and create drug-free villages. 
you know, the more I read this article, the more I feel like I'm reliving a half-hearted Nancy Reagan just say no campaign. Draconian zero tolerance drug policies are the antithesis of what these drug users need. Well, I applaud the free medical treatment that is offered if you turn yourself in. Some people are just not ready to give up their vice. You know the biggest irony of Nancy Reagan's Just Say No program? And the biggest proof that it doesn't work? Ronald Reagan's own daughter developed a cocaine problem. But I don't imagine that the Reagans allowed her to serve five years in a cage for her addiction. That treatment is only reserved for communities of color or any other vulnerable member of society who can't afford to find a lawyer to get him out of it. I wonder how many people now have HIV because the Reagans demonized drugs into a posh crusade away from reality. Even the whole Iran-Contra affair stemmed from Ronald's escalation of the war on drugs. I can't believe I was bamboozled into idolizing this fool. The only thing he actually accomplished is mass incarceration. Moving on to the convenience store industry, who is still panicking about tobacco tax increases and heavy regulations. We all know tobacco tax increases aren't going away anytime soon. But what effect does this constantly changing regulations have on the industry? Who in the past heavily relied on tobacco sales for their profitability? Well, in the UK, it's been an easy ride as Public Health England would like to have mass availability of the single best way to quit smoking. In fact, retailers are excited to see all the bottles of e-liquid replacing combustible tobacco. For the UK convenience store vendors, it's meant increasing the wall of products that cigarette packs once occupied. Unlike in the US, where the only thing you see is analog tobacco products, and maybe an occasional nicotine pouch or a jewel device that cuts into their profit margins. In California, you know the gross margin on a pack of cigarettes has been cut to just 7%? A far cry from the taxes collected on the very same product. It's gotten so bad that even the convenience store industry is fighting the additional tax increases because it's really cutting into their profitability. Now imagine how a mom-pop vape shop feels, especially because the shop was opened exclusively to empower others to quit smoking the way that the owner did. With all these problems caused by constantly changing regulations, isn't it time for some stability like they have it in the UK? Isn't it time to adopt harm reduction? It's pretty bad when even the convenience store industry is looking forward to the FDA's PMTA decisions to determine what ends products are going to be approved for future sales. Well, I got a bunch more that happened this week, but I know how long this news report already is. So let's jump into a little science before we wrap it up for today. Study finds drinking alcohol and smoking tobacco may reduce a person's risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Actually, previous studies already documented the fact people who smoke and or drink have a protective factor against Parkinson's. But now this study demonstrates a cause and effect relationship as it evaluated 1.2 million people to identify genetic links between alcohol drinking and tobacco smoking behaviors. I'll spare you the details of how they came up with their findings, but ultimately the analysis revealed a statistically significant inverse relationship between Parkinson's risk and the number of drinks per week. There was the same relationship with smoking and Parkinson's, but it didn't matter how many cigs people consumed, only how long they smoked. Knowing full well that long-term smoking and drinking pose serious health risks to individuals, they further postulated that heavy smoking increases mortality, so therefore heavy smokers may be underrepresented among the Parkinson's patients. But that does not negate the findings that people who are genetically predisposed to smoking and drinking are less likely to get Parkinson's. And while this study was looking for answers about Parkinson's, it once again reveals that genetic makeup may predispose some of us to seek addictive substances. For some, it might be alcohol. For others, it's nicotine. And depending on your genetic makeup, it might be both or a host of other things that your body is gonna naturally crave. You know, that's the wonderful thing about science. 
Once the truth is revealed and confirmed by other scientists, society can actually do something to improve lives. Just like with harm reduction, science has proven vaping is less harmful than smoking. So if you have a genetic predisposition to smoking, vaping allows you to get the substance that your body naturally seeks out and to consume it using a safer harm reduction product. And this leaves us with our advocacy segment. This week, we have the World Vapors Alliance and the Asia Harm Reduction Forum fighting misinformation with even more science. Published in the Vaping Post, more effective e-cigarette regulations could save approximately 200 million lives. A recent study conducted by the World Vapors Alliance together with the Consumer Choice Center examined 61 countries and their subsequent e-cigarette regulations. The research team used the UK's progressive tobacco harm reduction policies, which endorsed the use of e-cigarettes for smoking cessation as a reference point. Then they analyzed how many current smokers would be encouraged to switch in each of the other countries if they had access to a permissive framework like the UK. After compiling data from these countries, the research team concluded that with a regulatory regime which facilitates and encourages e-cigarettes as a means to quit smoking, 196 million of current smokers in those countries would switch to vaping. The results speak for themselves. In the UK, 25% fewer people smoke than they did in 2013. In Australia, where vaping regulations are arguably the toughest, that decline was only 8% during the exact same period. In the Philippines, vapes and heat not burn products can help 17 million Filipino smokers. Dr. Lorenzo Mata Jr., president of the advocacy group Quit for Good, said, We emphasize that the considerably less harmful product should not be taken off the shelves while the very much harmful product remains easily accessible and that the harm reduction potential of electronic vapor products should be maximized instead of regulated to minimize the risk of youth and non-smokers. Mata is a strong believer in tobacco harm reduction, which is defined in the 2021 Global State of Tobacco Harm Reduction Report as a range of pragmatic policies, regulations, and actions that either reduce health risks by providing safer forms of products or substances or encouraging less risky behaviors. And if you haven't seen my overview of the Global State of Tobacco Harm Reduction Report, here's a link for you. More than 117,000 Filipinos die every single year from tobacco smoking. Equally alarming is the measly quit rate of 4%, which has remained unchanged. Quit or die approach to public health does not work and must be abandoned immediately. It's the same message I've been preaching week after week after week. Because it's the scientifically proven solution to save people's lives. So you know what I'm going to say next. Go become an advocate and fight for harm reduction policies regardless of where you live. Even if it means ants are going to be using bully tactics on you that are increasingly personal, derogatory, and defamatory. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names are never going to hurt me. Why are the ants resorting to name calling and bullying tactics? Because they run out of arguments to justify their case. Science repeatedly proves vaping is 95 to 99.5% safer than smoking deadly combustible cigarettes. So become an advocate and help save people's lives. Well, that wraps up the Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the 16th of July, 2021. There is so much more I could have covered, but unfortunately, the brain can only digest so much information in half an hour. I appreciate every single one of you who stay current with Vaping News and fight the good fight for harm reduction. Until next week, be good to each other and have a fantastic weekend.